Hey, what's going on everyone? Just fixing my chair over here. Um, so today I'm going to go live in my personal personal page instead of my group page. And um, I'm going to have a guest today. So actually one of them, former clients as well, uh, Michael Holt. So let me try to get him on. Let's see. I'll try to get him on and we'll see if we can get it going. I'm going to message him right now. Just sent him a message. Okay, I have three people pop in. Let me see. Let me try to. Ah, uh, we figured it out. Hey, <laughs> I'm wearing the same sweatshirt. I, <laughs> I knew I would have this. Guest. This is actually for for the listeners. This Looks is actually Mike's company, like Savage Saints. I don't know the website, but I'm gonna make sure to list it in the description and everything. And I'm like, okay, sure enough, he's not gonna wear this sweatshirt, yeah. so I'll wear it to help. To help promote his oh, his God, brand, <laughs> brand, but sure enough, okay, yeah. Of course, I'm going to wear it. Dude, that's your, that's um, growing out your beard again, you know. So, <laughs> so let me just play around with yes, the sound here, really quick. Okay, um, so you guys, Mike is actually like a friend of mine. It must have been at least like three years ago, four years ago at this point, since I met him in HL. Uh, basically, kind of like the Czech Institute. It's like a holistic uh health institute etc cetera, etc cetera. and honestly the first time i saw him i'm like man this guy's on point he's like six three he looked like really healthy and vital his skin looked great as well and just he was like um even i was like too lazy to work out at lunch breaks you know i would just go and like lay on the grass or something but mike was like in the gym training and everything i would just do the mcgill big threes remember and then like call it a day i'm like oh, i'm done for the day <laughs> yeah and um uh, but he yeah. was in there training, man, and, and he's like a great example of, um, which is honestly rare these days, but like an actually like healthy health professional, <laughs> healthy health professional, the, the irony, right? Um, so it's, it's rare to run into people like this, and it's always great to chat with them just to kind of see how they've actually made it work in the real world, under real world stresses. Mike owns uh, a pretty thriving company as well where he has to manage a lot going on, but he still puts his like mental and physical health first, which it's easy to kind of mm -hmm. lose nowadays, you know, because a lot of times, especially in Western cultures, you're typically kind of like easily fall into the mindset of like, if you're not dying for your job or your career, you're not doing your job or career. And it's easy to kind of stumble into that when you're employed or self-employed or whatever. So, um, but I know it, it hasn't always been this way for you, Mike. So I think your story is great and a lot of people can relate sure. to it and take a lot out of it. So I just wanna kind of focus this podcast and show on, on you and your story and how you went about on an honest health and wellness journey instead of kind of just kind of subscoming to like quick symptom management strategies, which, you know, like medical drugs or stuff of that sort, which may work in the short term temporarily a little bit, but then the symptoms always return because the belief system was never changed that led to the problems, et cetera, et cetera. So this is just going to be casual coffee shop talk. So you're welcome to start wherever you like in your journey. And I'll try to sound sophisticated and throw some good questions your way. Yeah. Um, I guess the first thing that comes to mind is uh, I've had the good fortune of encountering good teachers. Um, and like you said, Good teachers are rare. Teachers who actually live what they teach are rare. Um, and in my line of work, in our line of work, you know, I'm a health and wellness professional, a therapist, a coach, you could say. Um, my, I'm my most important client. You know, if I am not living the principles that I teach, then I just become another depleted, sick, struggling individual and I'm not worth anything to the people who are coming to me. So in my life, I've made a very clear priority that nothing is placed above my health and wellness. And that's not a selfish commitment. I think in my view, that's like the ultimate selfless commitment because the better, the more vital you are, the more energy you have, the more skillful you will be of service in the world. So a lot of guys I work with fall into this trap where they don't have the time to prioritize their well-being, um, their fathers or their, their entrepreneurs or whatever. But the fact of the matter is that 
prioritizing your well-being makes you better at everything that you do. So it's really the greatest gift that you can give to the people in your life and, and the world at large. Well, we're so obviously kind of like I mentioned in the beginning, it wasn't like always the case for you. I actually remember like maybe a week ago or so you posted an old picture of yourself you know, and in terms of the transformation. Yeah, so let's, man. let's kind of start with that there. Like what, what situations led to that? And then I guess like what, mm. you know, pain teachers or what circumstances happened in your life that made you like, this isn't a sustainable yeah. path in my life. I need to like maybe do things a little bit differently. Yeah, so I'll give you a bit of a background, brief bio. I'm living in Venice Beach, California. I've been here for the past uh, 13 years, I think. But I'm born and raised in Philadelphia. And, um, you know, my, my whole inquiry into what is real health, what is real wellness, has, was motivated by my own suffering. You know, I can look back on a chapter in my life where things were pretty dark. Um, you, you saw the old school picture. That was when I was 22 years old. You know, I'm 38 now. I feel more energy than I did then. Uh, but at that point in my life, I was, I didn't really have any fundamentals of nutrition, hydration, that kind of stuff. It's like I, I was eating a standard American diet. That's the household I was brought up in. Um, and then on top of that, I had a lot of emotional turbulence going on. I was struggling with depression, low self-worth. I was regulating that or medicating that with alcohol. And then I would get into trouble with alcohol. I would get drunk, get in a fight, get locked up. And this just was happening a lot. <laughs> and when I was like 20, the years in between 18 or 17 and 22 were like crazy. And I got to a point where I was like, man, this isn't just going to resolve it. So, you know, this isn't, I think my mentality was like, this is my wild youth. And one day it'll just, the course will correct itself. But it doesn't just happen unless you make it happen. And so my life got challenging enough where I was like, God damn, I had to get, I got to get right with the man in the mirror. And I got to learn how to heal this guy. I got to figure this guy out. I got to learn how to love this guy. And, and that, that, set me off on a trajectory of an inquiry into meditation and really really like mind body well-being you know it's not, not your physique is important you want to beautify the temple you want to feel good about your reflection in the mirror but the real work is so much deeper than that it's so much deeper than that it's really in my view the whole path is about learning to love yourself as you are right now without placing any conditions on that so it's not i'll feel good about myself when i lose 20 pounds i'll feel good about myself when i make more money i'll feel good about myself when i get the girl no no no. it's right now you have to make the decision to love and care for the person that you are and care for the person that you are in a way that demonstrates that you have reverence for yourself and then that boils down to the way you manage your daily life what do you eat what time do you go to bed what's the quality of your water you know what's your movement like so it's it's a little if if a man's operating system as mine was was basically like uh i'm not not worthy of my own love and respect until i do x y y z it can be motivating in the short term. And there's a fear that if I just choose to love myself, that's somehow weak. Or if I do that, then I won't get anything done. But in my experience, that practice, that decision to love the man in the glass comes with an enormous amount of energy that you then channel into your cultivation of health and wellness. And then the more energy you put into your cultivation of health and wellness, the more energy that pra those practices give back to you, the more energy you have to put into the practices. And now you're living in like this positive feedback loop of love and energy. And, you know, I'll circle it back to the, the man I once was. 
when I look back on the struggles that I had as a younger man, 22 years old, you know, I couldn't imagine, I couldn't imagine that life could be the way life is now. So for anybody who watches this or is watching now, if you're struggling, know that things can get better. And you might come to a place where you look back, as I have, on the struggles that I was enduring and I say, oh, okay, I know I, I had to go through that so that I could become what I am and so that I can help people who are going through that now. Yeah, and you mentioned like a few like really important things in terms of um, the irony of how like putting like yourself first kind of comes off as very selfish, especially in even when colleges is kind of like oh mm -hmm. you know you got to put your family first this first that first but usually like at least from my observation what happens if you don't get your needs met first whether it be like in a relationship or it be like in a long-term career for sure the relationship or the career could work out but the problem is is like when you when you're not getting your needs met you kind of grow disgruntled towards that job over time you know so let's say like as a quick example sure. um let's just say you want to uh, be an artist you know but uh you got a job as a uh, factory manager or something of that sort you know so your ideal your core value would be like basically like sitting at the beach like drawing paintings of nature etc cetera, etc cetera. but you landed the uh manufacturing job because it may have been perceived as more like financially secure or something of that sort so maybe like a year or two, it's okay, you know, because you do get that consistent paycheck or whatever. But in the back of your head, because there's a disconnect in core values, and once again, your needs aren't being met, you kind of grow disgruntled towards the work, you know? And then like, let's say a project um, is behind and one of your clients doesn't do their job, then you kind of don't want to do the job. Now you're not liking the coworker because you have to do more of the work that you don't want to do because of them. And then there's some friction and tension that grows there. And, you know, a lot of people do continue their career paths that way for 20 or 30 years, and they might seem uh, kind of successful on paper in the sense that their LinkedIn profile is like a director, you know, executive. But at the end of the day, they're kind of like miserable, miserable people. So it's either like you burn out on that job altogether or you kind of stay with it, but you end up being miserable. And it's the same with relationships. If there's yeah. like a disconnect of core values and you're not having your needs met, in fact, you probably just have to be an actor in a way just to keep the relationship going like constantly not being yourself that creates a lot of like insidious stress and then you you will have uh you will be disgruntled like towards that person and most likely the relationship doesn't work out but if it does it's just like basically held together by misery and stuff of that sort of and each each of the partners make themselves miserable and you also mentioned like something super important as well in the sense that um maybe you can touch on this a lot more in detail but in the sense that a lot of people in this in a way like focus too heavily and i always tell people like man you're not gonna really create lasting change in any kind of transformation or any health journey if literally your focus is just on working out and eating better because a lot, a lot of people are like oh i have a health problem i'm like 20 pounds overweight i just need to eat a little bit better and work out a little bit more and somehow that's gonna solve my problems the reality it yeah. may be in some circumstances be the spark that leads people to seek real truth and answers which go a lot deeper than obviously nutrition and working out but most of the time people just really honestly genuinely believe like hey i got this issue all i need to do is just work out a little bit more and eat a little bit better and i'm sure you run into this time and time again and i was just wondering if you can kind of go into more detail uh, regarding the importance of having to go above that. Yeah, I think really it all boils down to your relationship with yourself. And uh, your primary work is to make that a healthy relationship. You know, I worked as a fitness trainer for years. And um, I enjoyed it for a period of time. But to your point, I was constantly working with people who had deeper issues than needing to lead fit, lose 15 pounds. And when your perspective is, okay, life, something feels off. I don't feel good. I need to lose 15 pounds or some superficial aesthetic goal because I can't accept myself the way I am right now. One of two things happens. You 
have a bit of a drill sergeant in your head and you will yourself to the gym and you either achieve the thing that you set out to do, but you're still left with this same internal operating system that fails to accept you. And now it's going to be, well, another 15 pounds or a bodybuilding show or whatever. That will happen. Or the other possibility is you beat yourself up inside so much that you just quit. You know, you're not enjoying the process. Um, so it's, it's much deeper than any kind of aesthetic aim. Um, when you land in this perspective and in this perspective of self-love, you know, I frame this as the real warrior's work. It sounds, sounds airy fairy, but it's the real work. And when you practice that and you practice it and it becomes real, it comes with a lot of energy. And then because you, love yourself and you understand that movement is good for you going to the gym is no longer an act of discipline or like some heroic endeavor that you gotta kill your inner bitch and get it done it just it just it's a no-brainer and it's actually enjoyable and and you're not you're no longer buying into this illusion that there's some future destination where you'll be able to say ah yeah good job i, I like you i love you you're you're giving yourself that now and that becomes the fuel that motivates you further and further than you ever even thought you could go but really it's about taking the carrot off the end of the stick you know we're chasing this carrot we think we have to look a certain way to get this carrot of self-love we think we have to earn a certain amount of money we got to do all of these things but just give yourself the carrot the carrot is unconditional loving acceptance of yourself as you are right now just eat the carrot it's right here you're the only one preventing you from having that eat the carrot and then like i said that comes with a lot of energy and that's been my experience. yeah and i think that's kind of like maybe a western culture issue of always seeking further advancement outside of oneself uh it's actually i used yeah. to be like a psychology fanatic you know uh even graduate my GPA from college in psychology, et cetera, et cetera. But I just found like over time, I actually renamed it as industrial psychology. Like typically like modern day psychology is like, I find it just focuses on like back in the day, kind of what you're hinting at, like real psychology was just all about discovering who you are and then just being that person and not actually changing anything or getting you better at something where like psychology today is like, Oh, let's, let's like fix, let's work on your anxiety, you know? And so you can work more or you can have more financial success or let's, um, let's work on your depression to better relate and more sex and more money, or let's work on this and let's work on that. It's always kind of like changing certain belief systems and it really has nothing to do without, with discovering like who you actually genuinely are and living close to that person. It's always kind yeah. of, or how to care for your actual physical flesh and bone. You know, I've had clients that I've worked with for six months or one year, and they've said, and this has happened more than a few times, wow, I feel like we've gotten further and deeper than I have in four or five years of talk therapy. It's not to, min it's not to say that the whole field is worthless. It's, it's not. There's a place and a time for talking things out. but how can you neglect the basic tenets of well-being movement sleep hydration nutrition if your wellness professional isn't checking in on those things what are you doing a lot of heady problems dissolve of their own accord when you start managing your physical body intelligently yeah mike you do have some little noise in the background i don't know if it's one of your like, meditation devices I, think, like I don't know. I don't hear anything. Oh, well, I, got it. Okay. Chair, I thought it was going to be one of these like sorry. meditation devices to get you to focus on some sound. I'm like, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> no. Nah. But that's another, you know, you, you bring up a, the practice of meditation. For me, that has been so foundational in getting myself in order. You know, it's like 
whatever your endeavor is, whatever your goal is, if it's physical, if it's financial, if it's in relationship, if it's whatever it is, your mind is going to be involved. So taking the time to sit with your mind, to understand how to govern it better, to come to a place where you can actually intentionally select certain thoughts and prevent your mind from generating certain thoughts. It's a a meta skill, contemplative practice that leads to performance excellence in, in all endeavors. So in my work, it's a critical foundation. You know, there's a lot of like new age spirituality out there about positive thinking and they neglect to tell you how meditation practice and again in my view i fl- i frame it like warrior's work it's not a passive relaxing pastime it's effortful diligent practice the cultivation of specific attentional skills you can approach your meditation practice with the same intensity that's required in in seeing results in the gym you know i think I, i'm a meditation teacher so a lot of people come to me to help refine their practice and i have a common experience of saying okay well do you meditate and they'll say yes but they're having a lot of problems depression anxiety whatever so i'm sure you've had the experience eugene of working with somebody who's terribly deconditioned not in great shape but they say well yeah i work out i work out four five days a week well what do you do doing in the gym you know working out is such a loosely defined term and meditation is such a loosely defined term so what you're doing in the way you're approaching both your workouts and your meditation matters matters the intensity that you bring to it i've had the good fortune of encountering teachers who who frame meditation practice as an effortful heroic endeavor that requires diligence and strong determination and for any man who thinks that meditation or inner work is hippy dippy, my challenge is to give it a try. You know, it's it's very challenging, especially in a world in a modern culture where the primary means of emotional regulation is distraction. To just sit, to just let the distraction go and just sit with yourself. You know, see what comes up. It's hard work, um, but it's totally worth doing. And in my view, like the only thing. Well, how's, how's your daily schedule look like? Can you kind of go over a general overview of how your week looks like and examples of like how you're tempted at times to miss a meditation session or a workout session, possible business endeavor or stuff like that and kind of what you tell yourself mentally to kind of keep prioritizing your mental and physical health? Yeah, I think, you know, I still... Some there will be days where I feel like I don't have the gas to get to the gym, or I would rather not sit on my meditation cushion. And some days I don't. I would say the vast majority of days I get it done. But that's just there's no secret there. I mean, it's just cultivating that that muscle of discipline, like just choosing to do the thing over and over and over and over and over again, and eventually it just becomes procedural. Like it's, there's not a lot of friction there anymore. It's not like, uh, it doesn't require a lot of discipline. It's just been, it's just part of the day, but you have to go through that. Each person has to go through that on their own. You have to engage in a bit of a battle with yourself to get yourself to do the thing that you know is best for you. And that comes down to this right here, the hoodie, Savage and Saint. So with regard to your internal operating system. You know, if you want to implant new habits that are beneficial and pull yourself out of the muck that you're in right now, you're going to need to contact a savage part of yourself that is just not going to settle for the bullshit. That is going to give you a swift kick in the ass and do the thing that you need to do with no excuses. Um, But that by itself is not enough. We also need the saint side that has this capacity to be loving and understanding and compassionate with yourself. Maybe you've had a really hard week. Maybe your task list is just long and you didn't sleep so great. And maybe getting to the gym is not the best thing for you today. So you need to have this 
capacity to discern that and to be able to treat yourself gently. So between those two poles, savage and saint, is the middle point of balance. And finding that point of balance, I think, is is the secret for consistency in the game. Do you find it's um, Do you find it's kind of like tough for the average person to do that at working? You know, like fifty hour weeks at the at like a corporate corporate job or stuff stuff of that sort. What's your advice for for that crowd? Often, like, uh, yeah. If you count the driving time to work, the work hours, and then the driving time back, it's basically like an all day activity. And even if you have some physical hours remaining, it's yeah. just you're like so drained and tired, you know, especially since most people have a mismatch in their core values and careers. They might not like working with all their coworkers, which drains their energy even more. After deadline, just sitting all day and being sure. sedentary is also kind of draining. I don't know what your, do you have any input on that? Yeah, well, the first thing would be, and it's not a quick fix, but you know, you 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 just brought it up. You would have to really look at yourself and discern what your core values really are, and inquire as to whether your life reflects those core values. And if it doesn't, then maybe you got to make some changes. I know it's not as easy as uh, if you're working 50 hours and you got a long commute, well, just quit your job and chase your dream. It's, that's an oversimplification of, a, of the issue. You know, maybe you have people who depend on you, children, a family. It's not that simple. But if you start to get clear on what your values are, what your purpose is, then you can start to correct your course so that your daily life reflects that. You know, the goal is really someone should be able to shadow you for your day and then tell you what your purpose is because it's it's self-evident through the, throughout the way that you live your life. Um, but that doesn't happen overnight. That's a process. And it's an uncomfortable process. It's not easy to ask yourself those bigger questions and to be honest with yourself about the direction that you're heading in and is that aligned with the direction that you want to be heading in. It's uncomfortable. And most people don't do it. That's why most people are working jobs that they feel no real soul connection to. So, in the short term, are you there? I think you're I do have pros on them. the reception issues. It's been a thing going on for two weeks. Like, oh. like I, I can fix hear it you. during the week, the and then on Saturday it comes around again. Maybe because like more people are are using their their home internet or something. I don't know. But yeah. Well, it's all good. I can I can hear you loud and clear, but. I guess just to wrap that question up, which is a great question, the long-term answer would be what I just articulated. The short-term answer would be, in my experience, a lot of guys, they come to a place where they're like, man, I got to make some changes. And then the first thing they want to do is, is get to the gym. Like, there's a lot of other low-hanging low fruit that you can leverage before you even start to work uh -huh. out. And actually, you should start to leverage before you work out. So even if you're working 50 hours, you got 10 minutes. To, to come to your contemplative practice. You can find 10 minutes. You can probably find 10 minutes a few times a day. That's a great place to start. After that, you can start to have a look at your breathing, your breath mechanics. You're breathing all day, you can optimize that. And if you optimize your breath, you start to feel more vital energy. Then you can have a look at your sleep. Then you can have a look at your nutrition and hydration. You can still maintain a 50 hour work week and do all of those things. And then you start to have the energy where it's like, okay, I actually need to move. I got to, I feel like I got a pep in my step. My body is bouncy. I got to work out. Your workout doesn't need to look like going to the gym for 90 minutes. You could schedule movement snacks throughout your day. Take walks. You know, walking is critical. Just take a 20 minute, 10, 20 minute walk two or three times a day. You don't have to get, you don't have to go to the gym if your schedule doesn't work right now. It, where there's a will, there's a way. If you want to get better, it doesn't, it doesn't matter what's, what your daily responsibilities are. You can. Yeah, I also, to, to kind of back up your point, I also find just a lot of people don't understand that working out actually takes energy. It doesn't give, you know, so you have, you know, the average American is yeah. going off like five hours of sleep, absolutely exhausted. They get to the gym at like 6 p.m. They have like a bang energy drink or some other 
stimulant. Then they do like a yeah. super cortisol producing workout, like a boot, like a boot camp or like a CrossFit because it's really to relatively cheap. And it also does give that person that community type feel, which they might not, not feel like they have because a lot of people just don't have community in their life anymore. And they're doing that are like super yeah. high intensity, super hardcore in an exhausted state. So the chances of injury kind of fly through the roof. And even if you don't get injured, I mean, dude, you're going to be like really exhausted and kind of like either two situations, like super short tempered, basically all day because you're running on absolutely exa absolute exhaustion, just like super passive in the sense that in the beginning, it'll probably be more like short tempered because cortisol is throwing, going through the roof. But because that body produces it in a limited supply, actually it just kind of halts the production of cortisol. And then you have this kind of like adrenal fatigue, like zombie type state where you're just kind of, even you're laying in bed sure. and you're kind of strategizing how much energy it's going to take for you to get in your car, drive to the grocery store, get the groceries. And if it's even worth doing that. And then obviously like your sexual vitality definitely declines a tremendous amount. Just like your activity goes down a lot. And that's kind of like the default state that most people are working out in. And then the irony is that like, oh, these workouts are actually helping me with my health in context dependent of course if they're coming from a place like you where they have like a lot of those low-hanging fruit already mastered sure it would actually have benefit to your day but if you're coming from like a very depleted exhausted state of poor nutrition and, and i hate to say it even when i hear a lot of people say like oh i eat healthy i mean they don't <laughs> you know nine nine percent of the time I yeah. just don't even really even know what healthy is. Like you ask them like, oh, what is eating healthy? And they're like, oh, I just eat less or I do fasting or I do keto or something like that. And they don't even hint on sourcing food or if that diet is right for them at that time in their life. And there's so much intricate details that even go into that. And, um, and I feel that's what also keeps them that path because it's kind of greenwashed. It's painted like you want to be healthy, you do tough workouts or you do a, a and you take some kind of supplement yeah. that's basically the western approach to to fitness for the most part i don't know if um, you have any tips for people that are kind of stuck in those cycles because uh well i just have some thoughts on what you said firstly um it's a great point and one point that i often make that going to the gym resistance training working out is an energetic expense and most people are energetically depleted and so then they're going Owing, they're in the deficit already just based on their lifestyle and then they're going to the gym and spending more energy than they have and sooner or later you know something's got to give you either get sick you get injured or you just have to quit yeah it's a good idea to leverage that lower hanging fruit most people really should even be in the gym if you look around it is unfortunate that in this culture, if you, when you come to a place where you want to make some changes, the first thing you think you should do is go to the gym. I told you I was a fitness trainer years ago. And before I pivoted to, you know, the work I offer now, which is more holistic health, health and wellness, vitality, which, of which fitness is a critical component, but it's not, it's not priority number one. Um, but as, as a tra trainer, as I started to, advance my thinking and further my education i started to tell my clients that in, i cannot in good conscience put you through a hard workout because you don't you, you shouldn't do it it's not good for you and i lost a few clients because they were addicted to the hard workouts even though um their physiques were not a yeah. reflection of the work that they were putting in because they were so depleted so for a lot of guys it's like you want to just go you go move the weight you crush it you want to get it done and it feels like is uh, I don't know wasting time, but to take two steps backward and have a look at your lifestyle, to start cultivating energy, to come to a place where you're in an energetic surplus and not an energetic deficit by letting go of the hardcore workouts for a while, take two steps back, you will take five steps forward. That was my experience yeah, working with. What you. a lot of people need to understand is like, uh, especially with. You know, a lot of people go to the gym, surely want to be healthy, but a large majority of them just want good as well and just feel good and be pain free. And I mean, to do that, the first cornerstone is just to build enough biological resilience through proper progressive overload. 
and to have proper progressive overload, you have to be mm -hmm. entering in pretty much like 90 plus percent of your workouts, at least in a very well rested state. So it kind of goes back to, um, yeah. there's a delusion that like, I have to just kill myself every single day in the gym just to see any gains. But if like difficult is all you needed, just go to any, um, go to any boot camps. They're very tough actually. They have you there running <laughs> over there, moving dumbbells quickly back and forth here. Then you got to carry this person across the street, this person across the street. But just kind of look at 99% of people in those classes, they like never change. They look the same and some even look even worse. And it's the same in going to a normal corporate gym like 24 hour fitness or goals gym, whatever. It's like you see people there, they're there for literally five or six days a week. And you see them there for like, find that if people don't approach it that way, they simply just get, yeah. Eugene, I just got to pause you because uh, you said you see those people there five or six days a week, but then you're-, you're Yeah, apologies for that reception. Is, I see the reception is going in and off. But you see them uh, there five days a week and I find if they just don't correct that path, it's typically what leads to burnout. Because eventually it's like you're thinking in the back of your head, you're like, dude, yeah. I'm investing all this time and what am I getting in return for, you know? I'm looking the same or worse, or maybe I make a little bit of progress, but yeah. then I take two steps back. Basically my average for the year is like no progress whatsoever. So a lot of people are like listening to this stuff and they might be like, oh yeah, Mike and Eugene, they're just saying sleep a little bit better, eat a little bit better, blah, blah, blah. There must be some some other magic to it, you know what I mean? And I'm like, dude, if, yeah. No, dude, that's, if, that's the thing. I yeah, the, what what you learn, you know, you've taken rigorous courses of study, and so have I. And you learn that wow, this shit is so simple. It is. It couldn't be simpler. It's not complicated at all to be healthy. It's not not to say that it's easy, because in a culture where everybody's sick, to be healthy requires, uh, you know, to remove yourself from cultural norms and and be truly alive, truly vital, truly healthy. In a culture where that's not the norm, you have to do things that most people don't do. So it's not necessarily easy, but it is very, very, yeah, in the very sense simple. that it's, it's easy to understand intellectually. Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning into the podcast. I'm curious, have you ever been confused by the labels in the grocery store? In Yevgeny's book, he demystifies the difference between caged, cage-free, free-range, and pasture-raised meats. He also covers how to avoid GMOs, source high-quality water, fish, supplements, and other related topics. It's a beautifully illustrated, non-technical read that comes with a comprehensive video series and other extended learning materials. Jump on Amazon and check out the book titled Anti-Factory Farm Shopping Guide by Evgeny Trefkin. Now let's dive back into the podcast. But try to actually apply it in a real mm -hmm. world that basically... Uh, if anything, shuns that kind of lifestyle, you know? Uh, and try yeah. Which is why it's critical to get in touch with your core values and let them dictate your course. It's also critical, in my view, to have some kind of practice around governing your own mind because it's your own mind that is going to be the determining factor as to whether you get well or not. Yeah, and so. to touch on your point too, I always, I always say this, but it's like, dude, it's like, you have to be insane to try to fit into normal society today where like nine out of 10 people, you could literally walk outside anywhere in America these days, and nine out of 10 people you run into are like full of obesity, misery, and disease. And it's like absolutely insane to try to follow their, their path, in my opinion. And it's not even my opinion, just go to pubmed.gov. Yeah. There are many studies on metabolic health of Americans, easily to find that nine out of 10 Americans right now are metabolically unhealthy like nine uh, 10 American adults rather. And that's like crazy, dude. If you think about like 90%, 90% people are like metabolically yeah, unhealthy. Crazy. And yeah. what's required to be metabolically healthy isn't even that much. Um, they're not even asking these people to be like Olympians. You know, that would be like one story. It's like, okay, no. I'm exaggerating here, of course, for comedy. Is your heart beating? It is, okay, you're metabolically healthy. And 90% of people like fail even that test, you know? so. Like a quick test, even for the listeners right now, I think you're doing what, what Mike is saying or what I'm saying. Okay, well, how many of you guys are optimizing your sleep and generally sleeping between the hours of 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. seven days a week? 
you know, to optimize, first of all, your body repairs itself uh, physically from 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. and then mentally from 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. And some people will be like, like, oh, yeah, I sleep those hours. But then you look at their sleeping logs, it's like they sleep those hours like maybe two days out of the week. Or sometimes they go like, okay, yeah, I go to sleep yeah. at 10, but really they, they're in bed at 10. They go to actually, they're actually sleeping by 11 p.m. So when you average it out throughout the week, they miss like seven hours of physical repair time, basically one full day of sleep every single week. And they're wondering why they're never recovering from workouts or they always have these random pulls or whatever that seem to happen or their, te their technique is perfect or their muscle isn't looking quite dense or just always like mentally foggy, et cetera, et cetera. That's just one example, but we can touch on what healthy eating even means, which could be like a two or three hour podcast or what using proper movement as medicine even means uh, or what, how to even go about, which I find is the toughest task for most people. Identify find your core values and really being genuinely true to them and actually making your week reflect what you want in your week instead of constantly having to be like an actor, you know, like in the back of your head, I want to be working three days a week, but you're working six days a week and then making up stories of why you need to keep working six days a week, et cetera, et cetera. But that brings me to another point. And uh, this is an important one because I find that like you can't solve a problem with the same belief system that to the problem. And I find people that are looking genuinely for help these days, if anything, it's more confusing than ever now with online like influencers, you know, this credible figure says this, another equally credible figure says the complete opposite of this guy. And then a third guy says both of these guys are like retarded and you shouldn't follow them. And I find it's even sometimes right. conf confusing for me. I don't know how it is for you. I invest so much time in education and I still find some things confusing, you know? So I could imagine like the average person doesn't invest that much time into like mental and physical health education. They're just kind of going online and just like this random person says, do this. And they have 2 million followers and they look kind of credible and they're like, okay, I'll do it. But then, you know, it, anyways, I'll let you, I'll let you take over on, on this part. Like, Well, I think, uh, yeah, there's a lot of information out there. There's somebody will tell you one thing and produce credible studies as to why they're right. Somebody else will tell you another thing and produce credible studies as to why they're right. This is the inf information age. There's no shortage of information and the amount of information out there is paralyzing. I think the solution is to address these simple factors that you and I have been discussing. The state of your mind, the depth of your breath, the quality of your sleep, your nutrition and your hydration, and your movement. And as you start to baseline those practices every single day, you start to awaken your own intuitive somatic intelligence where you know what you should be eating. You know the way you should be moving. You know how to govern your energy. You're not outsourcing that, that uh, those, those decisions to some external guru, master, scientist, whatever, you're living in such a way that the human body is the most highly biological attuned advanced instrument in the known universe, as long as you don't fuck it up. So if you engage this process of unfucking it up, a less vulgar way of saying that would be to manage yourself intelligently in a healthy way, you unlock this intuition that knows what you should be doing. And you start to live from that from that wisdom. It comes from your belly. It comes from your flesh and bone. You know what's true. You know what's not. But it's only because you're growing yourself intelligently. And if you're not, then, you, yeah, you're constantly going to be seeking out. Well, Eugene told me to do this, but he said to do that. But I should do this. And I read this in Men's Health. And blah, blah, blah. I don't know. Come here. Come here. You know, the answers are here. You just have to evoke them, and your lifestyle is either evoking the answers or burying them even Yeah, I was just going to say, well, if they're looking for men's health, then they're completely lost and should require a mentor, you know? If they're looking for men's health for health. <laughs> yeah, totally, man. I saw this shit uh, a while back with some dude, some black dude, he's a chef in men's health, bodybuilder type, juice to the gills, and he was telling 
people. They did some video on him. He's oh, yeah. telling people that he sleeps two hours a night. I don't know his name. Yeah, there's a, so much bullshit. Yeah, there, man. yeah. I, I don't, I don't know. It just, one, one positive thing to say is like, be careful, guys, with listening to any kind of influencer online. That includes even me and Mike. I'm gonna even throw us, throw us uh, into that category too, because even if they happen to be actually extremely competent, the thing is, they never met you personally, and in order to really genuinely help someone, mm -hmm. you have to really know their current and give them like a proper assessment give them advice on how to deal with that assessment uh, deal with whatever challenge abc they're having you know like nature is a novelty generator so it's like there are no two of anything there are even no two droplets of water that are exactly the same and then definitely no two even people that are exactly the same even if they're twins even if you look up twins you're, they're completely different as well so just be so because they're completely different, they require different approaches. So oftentimes too, what I find, unless you're already like extremely educated in the area, also listening to people online that never met you, it's easy to take their information out of context, you know, as well. And, and also like, like mm -hmm. you mentioned in the beginning of the show, you actually have the right tool, like meditation, for example, but you're applying it incorrectly. Because there is, you know, the one step is the right tool to use, but then also the next step is how do you apply it correctly? And then how do you apply it in a sustainable way to match your specific circumstance? And how long would you need to use that tool for? And what tool, what tool does this problem solve and what tool doesn't it solve? You know, because oftentimes formation um, uh, or whatever that uh, psychology is called, I forgot already. Uh, but yes, it's important, but then also, you know, you can't just kind of think your problems away. You also have to go out into the physical world and actually develop skills to solve them. For example, like if you have money issues, you can't just kind of like have mental imagery of money flowing into your account or your account being abundant. You have to go out there and get new skills or whatever, start a right. business and kind of make more money that way while at the same time doing positive affirmations or something of that sort. Uh, because I'll, same exact same exact thing when i'm getting back over here just and then also i mean at the end of the day uh too just i find sometimes people over complicate messages to make them sound unique you know to stand out in the marketplace because obviously if they're saying like oh you know you just need to uh you just need to sleep a little bit better work out a bit more you know use movement as medicine um meditate a bit more actually live true to your core values and sure, there, there might actually need to be coaching that goes with it. It's not like a product you can sell. But most people, like at the end of whatever they're trying to confuse you about, say, oh, here's the solution, like a supplement or something, some kind of like very quick fix solution. And I promise you, even to the most minor, like mental or physical health issues, there's literally no quick fix most of the time. It's usually a myriad of variables that need to be addressed all at once that are specific and unique to the individual as well, you know? Uh, um, yeah, that's very well stated, man. I like what you said, uh, nature is a novelty generator. Uh, I like that. And it's true, you know? It's, uh, and it, it comes back to my earlier point that no one will save you, you know? It's your responsibility to save you. And the best way to do that is to address these simple, fundamental, foundational aspects of well-being. And uh, that's the secret, you know, that's the work that I do. Some people call me a teacher. Um, I like to introduce people to the teacher that they are, the teacher that lives inside them. You can evoke that teacher, like I said earlier, by living in a certain way. And you realize that the answers are inside of you. The guru is inside of you. You just have to dig them out. He's buried underneath your awful habits that you've inherited from this culture that's not yeah, so touching well touching on the culture and the not so well i find it um i don't know how it happened or at what time it started to take place but i find that like corporate propaganda has uniquely made people believe that like what's not important is most important and what's most important is least important meaning like you know your career and, and striving for like a house and a car is like what's what's very very important usually at the expense of like your mental and physical health etc cetera, etc cetera. 
But I always say like, dude, like no matter like yeah. what you're trying to do in life, whether you're trying to be like a computer programmer or like a president of a company or whatever, it's like, how are you gonna accomplish literally anything without your mental or physical health? Like, how are you gonna accomplish something with major depression or like severe low back pain or something of that sort? Even somehow, if you manage to muster yeah. through it, I mean, it's just like a very painful, very painful existence. And then, okay, you know, you, you get to 40, 45 and on your LinkedIn profile, you're like, I'm a director and you have this smile, but behind the scenes, it's like you're on four to five different prescription medications, you know, you need like a bottle of Xanax and three Red Bulls just to have enough energy to wash your dishes in the morning. Uh, you weren't able to have like sex without Viagra for already like two years. It's like, dude, those are all red flags that like your 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 direction and belief system in life is just not sustainable and not healthy for you, which in my opinion is like the deadliest virus of belief system that leads people to healthy patterns and eventually kills the hosts. And usually unfortunately passes those belief systems down to their kids as well uh, because you kind of hinted yeah. earlier like oh you know maybe you got to work this job because of your kids etc cetera, etc cetera. and i did a uh, in-depth uh podcast with one of my other clients uh a very kind of high-end computer programmer that ended up quitting her field to move off grid with her kid because she didn't want to be an example of what unhealthy living is to their kids know uh, because kids they learn 80 percent of what they learn from you is just from observation so it's like when they see you you know working yourself to death gaining a lot of weight uh because you're eating poorly um you know ab abusing or misusing prescription medications because you refuse to change the behavior that led to that problem they're going to do the same exact thing they're they find that acceptable because kids look up yeah. to you especially at an early age like you're like some demigod you know so they're going to copy and paste what what you're doing yeah. as well so i feel like the parents responsibility especially if you have kids to show an example of what healthy and sustainable living looks like you know because if you're not doing it guess what i agree your kids are going to be the same exact way and it's your fault and that's it yeah, I think I think uh, you could make a pretty strong argument that the greatest gift you can give your children is to be raised by a happy, healthy father or a happy, healthy yeah. mother. Not not to be raised by a parent who has this perspective that they need to sacrifice their health and happiness for their child. Yeah, and can you um, can you go into uh, your journey of like maybe some mentors that really kind of helped accelerate your process? Yeah. yeah, I mean, like I said, I've had, when I look back, I feel so blessed that I've encountered the teachers that I have. Um, you know, you and I met through the Paul Check curriculum, Holistic Health Lifestyle Coach Level 3. So Paul's been a, been a real um, model of what is possible when you identify your values and live true to them. You know, what's possible with regard to aging gracefully. I think he's in his middle 60s now and he's strong as an ox. Um, and, you know, I have a fitness background and I, I mentioned before, I also had done a deep dive into meditation. So some of the meditation teachers that I, so I'm so grateful for, one is Shin Zen Young. He's uh, an elder. He's probably in his 80s now, former uh, Zen Buddhist monastic, um, but really just like the real deal. Like my meditation teachers, if you haven't really gone into the, if you haven't done an exploration of meditation, you may not know that the majority of meditation teachers teach like lightweight kind of stress reduction, which is useful, I guess. But the teachers that I've been drawn to are the teachers who talk about enlightenment you know, absolute freedom, uh, non-duality, you know, the no self experience. And these are all available to anyone who applies themselves to the practice. Reality becomes very psychedelic when you learn how to concentrate at a very high level. Um, so Shinzen is a teacher who, you know, makes me question reality or made me question reality in a way that was very useful. George Haas is another one. Um, Dan Brown recently passed away, but he was like 
a light on planet Earth. And that dude was savage and saint, let me tell you. He was like, you know, you think meditation teacher, you think of like a little, oh, namaste, yeah, happy, joyful. And he was happy and joyful, but he was also a savage. I mean, he was like, he wouldn't tolerate any bullshit from his students. He was tough. And I remember seeing him and being like, wow, you can be a meditation teacher, master, and still be like a man. Hell yeah. Um, so Shinzen Young, George Haas, uh, Dan Brown. And then, I, like I said, I had a fitness background, but I had this deep interest in meditation and spirituality. And then I found Paul Check, and he was like the connecting bridge between physical fitness because these meditation teachers that I mentioned, you know, they weren't like in the gym. They're just, they're not fitness dudes. But Paul was kind of the one that like unified these spiritual curiosity that I had and this spiritual path with the simple mundane self-management principles of, you know, things like bedtime. And it became very clear to me that the health of your body is an accelerant in in your spiritual disciplines or your spiritual inquiry so it's really those teachers those men those wide el wise elders have helped me to find my path my way my way and now it's like everything that i do there's no compartmentalization in my life i don't have my workout routine my martial art routine my meditation routine my work my professional life it's all the same thing it's the, it's my way and so that's very liberating for me um so yeah i'm very grateful that i fell into the laps of the teachers who i who i encountered and that i had enough sense to listen and and make time to spend time with them because it's really it's been a, a very rewarding um, aspect of my life and I've been able to now I'm in a place where you know I'm, I'm not, not a youngster I'm 38 years old and I've been able to distill what I've what I've gleaned from all of these teachers into my own thing and now I'm offering that to the world and so I feel very I hey, feel very rewarded Mike I work. still think we're young compared to the 80 year old guy you know <laughs> always like well, we are, but we're not as young. We're not yeah, as young as we old. used to be. <laughs> Actually, I, I don't yeah. either. I, I never thing. felt younger, to be honest with you, man. I, my my only regret, bro, is like, I'm like, yeah. Imagine if I knew this shit when I was 17. You know, so sometimes I have a young guy in the circle. I offer men's work, and you see a youngster come in, and I think, God damn, bro, if you really get this stuff now, you're gonna be a actual superhero yeah i find like um i just find kind of like the standards have dropped so low you know like you see even 20 year olds kind of reaching out and they're like hey should i do this testosterone and i'm like dude if your testosterone is low at 20 you have like so many other things you need to work on to get those back up and like a myriad of other things yeah uh or, or well it's like you said earlier it's a quick fix we're, we're addicted to a quick fix but there's no quick fix fixing this you know it's a long slow it's a long slow process with no finish line there's no destination here it's this constant cultivation and you have to just enjoy the journey there is no it, it well, what do you end. think regarding quick fixes um because i know this is a very popular approach for people in western cultures like i have a problem i go to my family physician which and they give me medical drugs What's your, what's your yeah. take on where the medical community's management of kind of basically diagnosing symptoms and treating those symptoms with possibly like harmful and dangerous medical drugs, and that's it. Like they literally like don't address like literally anything else. You know, they might tell you like, oh, you know, work out a little more, sleep a little bit better, work. Yeah, it's it's ludicrous. It's ludicrous, and I don't know you. Evil. No, we can't go, go too far down, down the rabbit hole, but yeah. But he, here's the thing, man, that I'll tell people when they ask me about my work. I say that I am a health professional. I study health and what it takes to be healthy, 
and I teach people how to be healthy. And I have a very high expectations of the people that I work with that they're going to have to summon discipline and make changes. Um, the medical profession, I don't think doctors are evil people, but the industry has become such that they are sick professionals. They don't study health, they study sickness. And the totality of their education is how to mitigate symptoms of the problem that is lifestyle. Your problem is a result of how you're living. Your doctor will give you um, something to numb you out to the symptoms that your body is mm-hmm. giving you to say, please take better care of me. Doctors do not study health. They're largely ignorant in health. And they don't have time to really be with their patients or high expectations of their patients. So if you leave your health in the care of a sick professional, the best that they can do is make you feel less sick, but they cannot make you help you to feel well. I used to have a doctor, bro. I have health insurance just because it's responsible. I feel like if I get hit by a bus, you know, I'll, 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 I'll need to be taken to a hospital, but I don't go mm-hmm. to my doctor if I have a problem. Um, but as part of my health insurance, I get a physical once per year. I'm already paying for it. So I figure I might as well check in once a year and see what they're doing. My doctor is obese, literally. It's, it blows my mind. And the once a year that I go to get my physical, just the whole hospital is, it's sterile with artificial lighting. And it's just such a, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm sensitive. You know, I've, I do a lot of work that my body is sensitive. I just feel, it feels so gross inside the building. So bullet point, if you take anything from what I just said, take this. If you leave your well-being in the care of a sick professional, the best that they can do is make yeah. you feel less sick. If you want to be well. Yeah, and I would say moreover, like make you perceive that you're less sick, but you're still sick. Because you know, for example, right. like an easy one exactly. that everyone understands, if you have a rock stuck inside your shoe, like people like you and I would just tell the person like, hey, let's take the rock out and then let's kind of fix your shoe so you don't get rocks in there in the future when you go running. Where like a medical doctor would tell you like, hey, you got a rock stuck inside your shoe, keep it there. Let's have you take painkillers instead. It will be okay. And how like stupid does that sound, you yeah. know? Uh, it's pretty ridiculous. And yeah. then like, like you mentioned, when you go into hospital, I mean, I don't remember the last time I saw like a healthy looking medical doctor or a nurse practice. Um, no, and nurse, exactly. Yeah. The weird thing is, it's like, I don't know, man. Like I actually interviewed a few. I actually asked this deep question with a few and also on some medical forums online. Uh, and I would say like, oh, you know, like, meet a person you typically even if they're relatively healthy it typically takes um around like two to three hours to assess them and to really understand their situation how they got into that situation and what really needs to be done to have a complete resolution of that specific situation and then on the form the the medical docs and mds will come in oh you know like if a person comes in with they listed like six different symptoms you only have five minutes to treat them you solved it and i'll be like dude I wouldn't ever work in a situation where I only have five minutes to talk to a patient anyways, because I care too much about the patient. And if that's all the job or the, the hospital or whatever yeah. uh, allows me to do, I wouldn't work there. And if you're working there, you're just selfishly looking after yourself in a paycheck instead of the client's well-being. But I think what a lot of medical doctors forgot is they took an oath in medical school to give their clients the best service possible and the best solution possible for their illness. So if the best solution possible for the illness is to change a belief system that's leading to behaviors that's leading to problem ABC, then that's how it should be approached. So if there's a rock inside the shoe, you need to take the rock out. You need to stop telling your client to keep the rock there and take painkillers instead, because that's ridiculous. Now, there is a bit of a two-way road. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people, they don't want to change. And they use these kind of drug dealers to reinforce that lack of wanting to change as well. That's true. True. You know, the, the, the most important thing is self-responsibility. And it's easy to sit here and say, oh, the, mer- the medical system in America is evil and X, Y, and Z. But you have to claim responsibility for yourself. 
you know, your well-being is your responsibility. That's self-reliance. That's self-governance. And victim culture is pretty popular right now. There's a whole currency around, you know, how, how the degrees to which, which I'm oppressed are somehow valuable as a social currency. And that all makes me quite sick. Claim responsibility for yourself. And in claiming responsibility for yourself, you know, spend less time with your doctor because chances are your doctor doesn't know shit. Yeah, of course, care unless you. you want just to be given medical drugs. And then guess what? You know, you have high blood pressure system yeah. that led to that. Okay, it's going to lead to a myriad of other health issues in a long enough time frame. So what's your only option? Like to be on 50 medical drugs by the time you're like 60 or something and looking and worse than ever before. I even have a few of my former clients here. They already shared their stories. So it's okay that I share. Like Tim was like, dude, on like so many medical drugs for pretty much 20 years of his life, we got him on a program basically just mastering yeah. the key concepts we've actually talked about today. In one year, he's off like nine medical drugs. I'm like, what happened? Yeah, it's amazing. Amazing, man. It's, ama it's amazing what happens when you claim responsibility for your well-being and you seek out somebody who can help you along the way, like you. So that's amazing. You know, one thing comes to mind. The holidays just passed. I go home to Philly and uh, stay at my parents' house. I sit in the living room with them. They watch the evening news. And it just blows my mind that every commercial break, literally, four out of five of the commercials are for some pharmaceutical it's when you start to re really zoom out and get a perspective on what is considered normal just the fact alone that pharmaceutical companies market directly to the consumer is insane yeah. that doesn't happen in, in other countries that's a uniquely american phenomenon it's insane. No, it's a, it's a, it's it's a very disgusting culture. These companies. And then you got these. You have these like sexy, you know, uh, pharmaceutical sales reps that go to doctors' offices and like, hey, have you, have you heard about the new whatever? It's, it's a weird, incestuous drug dealing. The the food industry and the pharmaceutical industry. It's all. But you have to just remove yourself from it. Just You just don't participate. I don't participate in it. And I know you don't. And so, like I said earlier, if you want to be well, truly well, in a culture where that is not the norm, because look around, it's not, then you have to do things that most people don't do. And you have to mm -hmm. not do things that most people do do. That makes you an outlier. Yeah, so you kind of broke up there in the last, like, quick line. But yeah, I totally agree. And I mean, my grandma that raised me off grid for a certain portion of my life in Ukraine, like literally went to the doctors one time her whole entire life. That's to give birth to my mom. She died. My grandma died at 87 at very good health. And she just she lived off grid pretty much her whole entire life. She never really had like an actual job or anything of that sort. Just living through, just instinctually to a lot wow. of the principles we talked about here. Not too far fetched. And sometimes people are like, oh, well, people are living longer. It's like, okay, like basically being incapacitated and like in a nursing home for the last 15 years of your life where someone like wipes your butt, I wouldn't consider that living longer. And also, I mean, if you take into consideration child mortality, like hunter gatherers before even the field of nutrition or personal health coaches or whatever medical science was around, they're pretty much living to about the same age people are today. And I would say they're living in way better health and way more quality than people are living today. Like today, it's, it's like, dude, in a hunter-gatherer society, guys like me and you would be like probably below average. You know, the fact that we're the top 1% yeah. right now is the, is the alarming thing. That's the red flag, you know? Uh, that, and, and yeah. dude, the saddest part is like people are like, they've totally normalized it. They've like normalized pathology. It's like totally normal. It's like, this is just what you do and how life is, which is like, that's the saddest part of all, man. I don't know how, how you kind of deal with that, you know, because I'm pretty sure you see it. You see it every day as well. Well, here's how I deal with it, man. And I'll tell you, like, I went through a phase on my journey where I got really angry about all of this stuff. 
um, you know, the this idea that uh, governments are in bed with pharmaceutical industry, with the food industry, that we're being poisoned, that it's enough to make you pissed. And I got really pissed. And I just wanted to revolt. I wanted to revolt, rebel. Like, there's a real revolutionary thing that lives inside of me as part of me. And I learned that, you know, the, the most efficient revolution, the real revolution, is to get yourself in order, to not participate in this stuff, to live as, example, live as an example of what's possible, to become whole, to become well. That is the warrior's work of our times, to be healthy, to be happy, to be fulfilled. That is the revolution. And each man's life is his own revolution. And so that's the responsibility that I claim is to get myself in order, to continue to grow and to try to inspire some people to do that along the way. And uh, if that appeals to you, then get with me and we'll talk. And I'm trying to lead a movement of men and who are strong, and not, not just physically strong, but strong in mind, body and spirit. And so that's the revolution. That's how I deal with it. I rebel tenaciously and aggressively every day, um, but not in a way that's angry or in a way that I go to protests. That's not my revolution. My revolution is my daily life. Yeah, and even like small things people can do. I mean, there are so many, so many things, but even like trying to work remote initially can provide that distance, you know, to make you think, to allow you to think a little bit more clearly because even working remotely can give you an extra like, hour or two hours every single day to yourself you know so you can sleep in a little bit more and be more well rested think more clearly also you can kind of distance yourself from like what i find to be and i agree with me here but i take a strong stance at this is just the pathology of corporate work there's just uh it's very very hard to like optimize your mental and physical health in today's corporate environment especially the bigger the company the worse the problems are it's just um and it's very tough to think clearly and also just think in a very healthy and sustainable way and succeed in that environment being there. So the more you can kind of distance yourself from there, just the better better you, you will be, in my opinion, and from my observation. Because if you kind of continue to, um, which I find is what healthcare kind of has to come to today, they're not even trying to change anything. They're really just more in the mindset of like, how can we stay in this cesspool or swamp of pathology and just learn how to survive. So they're always tinkering, you know, maybe we could just give this guy some anti-anxiety medication so he can work more, you know, numb him out here. Uh, you know, we can, you know, 10 years later when his blood pressure is through the roof because he's working way too many hours and under way too much stress, we can just give him these medications. Then we can get like five more years out of him before his heart explodes or something of that sort. Uh, instead of just saying like, man, wouldn't it be easier if we just like, stepped out of the swamp you know well that's the thing it's like i hear what you're saying what if we as a culture or society just did this or did that but that will only happen when enough individuals remove themselves from the game and so that's like to my earlier point the real revolution is how are you managing yourself as an individual concern yourself with nothing else other than that are you participating in the game that you don't believe in? Then make the plan to remove yourself. But that's the real revolution for me. It's, it's, it's individual. You know, your revolution is your daily life. And it, it'll drive you crazy. Well, why don't we do this? Why don't we do that? We should do this. Bring it all the way local, all the way local. What's your relationship like with yourself? That's the sole focus. And if enough people make that shift and claim that responsibility, then it'll change. But that'll just happen. Where do you feel it's kind of like society is headed these days? More of more of the same or getting worse? Or it's kind of tough to tell. Like sometimes you see hints of progress, but then it's like, then you see like the uh, C word come around and everyone all of a sudden like drops their core values and all their ideals you know, when a little bit of fear kind of hits their, hits their nerves, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, yeah. I think it's easy to get caught up in this 
in a in a bit of a nihilistic view and maybe this conversation is tending toward that a little bit like things are so bad things have never been worse people are crazy there's evil oppressive regime but you know we've also never been safer you know people are things are changing for the better so i don't know um, life um, i would imagine human life has always been a been chaotic a mixture of good and evil um sanity and insanity and i don't think that the times that we find ourselves in here now are any different than they've ever been um it's like i said and i'll just keep harping on this point you just have to strongly determine which side you're on and live in a way that reflects that that's the best a man can do well are there any other any other topic you I'm like I'm happy to kind of like explore any any topics you want to kind of go on. Um, no, I just wanted to let the guys know who might be listening. Um, you know, I'm going to be offering a course, a 12 week course online. Uh, we're going to be starting February 13th, Monday evenings. And go to May 1st, so Monday evening, 6:30 p.m. PST. And it's just going to be a 12 week journey into what we talked about before, like this idea of taking two steps back to then take two to take five steps forward. So the course is called Masculine Vitality. Uh, it's offered for men only, and it will be about cultivating energy to have a look at your life, to see where you're leaking energy, to make the necessary adjustments over a 12 week period um, so that you start to live in an energetic surplus and an energetic surplus births creative energy um, you have the energy that's required to do the things that are meaningful to you um, in my experience both personally and professionally there, like we said earlier there's a lot of information out there you know sometimes a man comes to a point in his life where he knows he needs to make a change but there's so much information there's so much things he, he feels he has to do. It's paralysis by analysis. You don't know where to start, so nothing changes. Um, but the way I've designed this curriculum, it's appropriate for any man, wherever they're at on their health journey. The way I've designed the curriculum is to like slow and steady wins the race. We're gonna make daily lifestyle modifications at a way that's in a way that's easy to metabolize and progressively cultivate learn how to cultivate more energy so i'm very excited about it i've poured a lot of art, art and smart into it okay. and uh, it's going to be good cool. it's going to be and also i'll get the link uh from you mike later so people can just kind of prep to make it easy oh, cool. for them as well yeah yeah so um thanks again for being thanks again for being on a guest it's great to see you as well uh hopefully yeah, hopefully yeah, we can connect pleasure, like in the future sometimes. And thank you, everyone who jumped in on the live as well. Um, wishing you guys the best this weekend, okay? All right, guys. Have a good one. Bye. Thanks. Thanks for tuning into the podcast. If you've ever had trouble losing weight, or you've lost weight, but still didn't have the ideal body or health you're aiming for, please feel free to reach out anytime and book an assessment. Eugene will work with you to cover your goals in detail, see what's holding you back, and go from there. In the meantime, feel free to check out the countless testimonials on Eugene's website in the link below. In the testimonial section you'll notice everyone has various backgrounds, are of all different ages, and all have had different challenges in their life, but they all have one thing in common, they were all able to find their health and achieve their ideal body. You're also welcome to add yourself to the Facebook group in the link below. There you'll have access to the live videos that Eugene does weekly on Sundays and other helpful content. Thank you again for tuning in.